All right, we're going to be in Nehemiah this morning. Nehemiah chapter number 5. Nehemiah chapter number 5 this morning. And up to this point, we've seen Nehemiah have a burden for his people. He, in chapter number 1, we start out, and uh, Nehemiah learns of the, uh, the ruins that his home is found in. Uh, Judah and Jerusalem. And he, his brother comes and gives him the lowdown. He says, hey, uh, the, the, the walls are torn down. The gates are burned with fire. Uh, it's a mess there. And then we see that uh, that burden turns into uh, a, 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 it turns into real life. And he goes and he, he goes to Jerusalem. The king paves the way for him to go, right? He gives him the lumber and the things that he needs. He, he pays for his journey. He, and ultimately, he could have said, no, Nehemiah, you're going to stay here and continue to be my cupbearer. But in God's provision, he allowed him uh, to be under that king and to be sent back to Jerusalem. As he got into Jerusalem, we see over and over there's opposition. There's opposition on every side. He, he, he is here rebuilding the wall. And there are people from every part of the country uh, trying, to, trying to take over and trying to break down the walls that they're rebuilding. And here as we come into chapter number 5, the enemy is no longer without, the enemy is within. And those are the most dangerous enemies, aren't they? The ones that are within instead of those that are without you. You expect the ones that are outside the camp to be opposed to you. But the ones inside the camp, you're not really, uh, you, you don't really expect them to be your opposition. So this morning as we get into chapter number 5 of Nehemiah, we're going to see that uh, there are some things going on that uh, were against the law of God. And Nehemiah is going to call the, the, these religious or these leaders out and say, Hey, guys, what you're doing is against God's law. And ultimately, it's slowing down the progress of rebuilding the wall. You must stop now. Let's read Nehemiah chapter number 5 this morning. Verse number 1 says this, And there was a great cry of the people and of their wives against their brethren, the Jews. For there were, were that said, We, our sons and our daughters are many, therefore we take up corn for them that we may eat and live. Some also there were uh, that said, We have mortgaged our lands, vineyards, and houses that we might buy corn because of the dearth or the famine or uh, the, the being without food. There were also that said, We have borrowed money for the king's tribute. And that upon our lands and vineyards. Yet now our flesh is as the flesh of our brethren, our children as their children. And lo, we bring into bondage our sons and our daughters to be servants. And some of our daughters are brought unto bondage already. Neither is it in our power to redeem them, for other men have our lands and vineyards. And we see there's a shift. This is Nehemiah talking. It says this, and I was very angry when I heard their cry in these words. Then I consulted with myself and rebuked the nobles and the rulers and said unto them, Ye exact usury, or usury, every one of his brother. And I set a great assembly against them. And I said unto them, We, after our ability, have redeemed our brother and the Jews, which were sold unto the heathen, and will ye even sell your brethren, or shall they be sold unto us? Then held they their peace, and found nothing to answer. Also I said, It is not good that, what, that ye do. Ought ye not to walk in the fear of our God, because of the reproach of the heathen, our enemies? I likewise, and my brethren, and my servants, might exact of them money and corn. I pray you, leave us, let us leave off this usury. Restore, I pray you, to them, even this day, their lands, their vineyards, their olive yards, and their houses, also the hundredth part of the money, and of the corn, the wine, and the oil that ye exact of them. Then said they, We will restore them, and will require nothing of them. So will we do as thou sayest. Then I called the priest, and took an oath of them, that they should do according to this promise. Also I shook my lap and said, So God, shake out every man from his house and from his labor that performeth not his promise. Even thus be he shaken out and emptied. And all the congregation said, Amen, and praised the Lord, 
and the people did according to this promise. Let's pray. Father, this morning as we look at your word, God, we see that there's uh, some disunity in the camp here. God, there's some, some things going on in the camp that go against your law. And God, I pray this morning as we dive into your word, that you help us uh, apply this to our lives. And God, that we uh, be more unified so that we can continue to rebuild the walls here in America. God, help us this morning. Just say a prayer. Amen. Amen. The first thing we'll notice this morning is the outcry in verses 1 through 5. It wasn't an outcry of the Jews versus the people of the land, or even an outcry of the people of the land versus the Jews. No, this was an outcry of Jews versus Jews. For some context in this section here in Nehemiah chapter number 5, uh, we, we must go back to the Torah, the law. In Deuteronomy chapter number 23, verses 19 through 20, the Bible says this, Thou shalt not lend upon usury to thy brother. Usury of money, usury of victuals, usury of anything that is lent upon usury. Unto a stranger thou mayest lend upon usury, but unto thy brother thou shalt not lend upon usury. That the Lord thy God may bless thee in all that thou settest thine hand to in the land, whither thou goest to possess it. So here we come and we see that these men are breaking the law that God had set for them. Uh, we, we see that uh, in, in, from the beginning of time, from when Abraham was called to lead this people, God wanted a unified people, right? God wants us to be unified today. And so here, Nehemiah is reminding them, hey, guys, God set this law up not so that we would take advantage of one another, no, so that we would help each other out. Here we see that, that God was telling them, hey, you basically shouldn't charge interest. Usury is an interest on something that's borrowed. You shouldn't charge interest in money, food, land, or really anything you can charge interest for. And if your brother is borrowing something from you, don't charge them interest. Right? But here, and then it goes on to say, but if it's a stranger in the land, you're allowed to charge them interest. If they're not your brethren, go ahead and charge them interest. And you're not taking advantage of them, you're just doing business. But when it's between the brethren, it's not business. No, you are building relationships with them. Then we notice the reason for the outcry. They tell Nehemiah, hey, Nehemiah, we have lots of sons and daughters. We have to feed a family, and we can't do it. We don't, have the, we don't have the corn. We don't have the money to buy the corn. We don't have the land anymore. We have, uh, Nehemiah, we've, we've given everything for the rebuilding of the wall. We can't feed our own families. They likely had neglected their fields due to the con total concentration on rebuilding the wall. They had spent many years rebuilding uh, this area. And so uh, their fields had been left alone. There, there, there were no fields uh, left to be tended to because the, they had just turned into weed piles. While their fields sat on work, they had to find a way to buy food. It seemed like they allowed others to work their field in exchange for grain or for corn. This is what verse 3 seems to be talking about when it says that they mortgaged their lands, their vineyards, and houses to buy corn. There was scarcity in the land. While, while they were working on the wall, the nobles and, and those people were building their fields up, weren't they? They were taking care of themselves. While, uh, while the, the brethren were building walls, the, the, the leaders were taking care of themselves. They were building up their own barns. They were building up their own grains. They were building up their own pocketbook. And here Nehemiah says, hey, no more. We, we have to be unified in this. While the work in the field hadn't been done, it didn't stop the king from still charging taxes. Uh, I, I, I opened my, my uh, assessment of my land from the tax assessor's office this year. And I haven't done any, I haven't done any upgrades on my home at all. And guess what? My, my assessment of my land went up. Why? Uh, it's the same thing going on here. Nothing, they weren't working their fields. They weren't doing anything that would require them to be taxed. And yet the taxes still continued to go up. Didn't they? 
And so they said, hey, Nehemiah, number one, we don't have fields to feed our family. Number two, we don't have money to feed our family. And number three, we're having to sell everything we have to pay the taxes that the king is charging because we don't have food and we don't have money. It's a terrible place to be. And here we see that the brethren were taking advantage of this. They were extorting them for more money. Things had gotten so bad that they had to sell their kids into bondage. Can't imagine. Things getting so bad here in America that we're having to sell our kids into bondage to pay for food. And to, pay, uh, and to be able to survive. But that is exactly what they were having to do. One commentary said this, The Jewish people of wealth are primarily concerned with themselves. They're not thinking about the effect their financial dealings have on the ability of the poor to feed themselves, care for their children, or devote themselves to the work of the wall. Because of how money was being handled, the work of the wall was in jeopardy. They had to choose to work in the wall or tend to their fields so they could feed their children and pay their taxes. They had to make a choice. You said, what is the dilemma? The dilemma is that the wall, the, the work on the wall is going to stop because no one can continue to work because they don't have food and they don't have money. How do you know that you need food and money to survive? Everyone needs food and money to survive. And they had neither. And then they were being taken advantage of by the brethren. And so here we see Nehemiah's address to the people. Verse number 6, the Bible says that he was very angry. Uh, they came and they, they cried out to Nehemiah and they told him all the things that were happening in the land. And the first reaction of Nehemiah was that he was very angry. I'm sure that Nehemiah was taking everything into consideration. It wasn't just this one isolated issue. He was thinking about all those that opposed him on the outside. He's thinking about those who had set their camps around about the city so that they would be intimidated and not to be able to continue the work. And those who lived outside the city uh, had to move inside the city because they were getting attacked on the way to work. And he's thinking, man, think about all the opposition going on around. The last thing I need is opposition going on in the, the camp. He was angry with a righteous anger. He was angry, but he wasn't sitting. We're going to notice the next verse tells us how he was angry and didn't sit. Right? So we see that he was very angry. And then the first part of verse number 7 tells us that while he was very angry, he consulted with himself. It literally means that he took counsel with himself. He, 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 took, he, he examined his heart. He, he didn't just go in there with guns blazing, ready to, ready to take out all those who were taking advantage. No. So he's very angry, and then he consulted with himself. And he said, man, let's think about this for a minute. How do you know when you react out of anger, things normally don't go the way you want them to go? When you go in and you're angry, most of the time, no solution is ever found. Because you go in angry, and the only person gets angry, and then it's just a mess. So here we see that Nehemiah was very angry, but then he stops. He took counsel with himself. Before he went into the nobles, he got control of himself. How many of us know we need to do that? Before we go into those who are opposing us, we must uh, take ourselves, we must control ourselves. Then he goes in and he rebukes the nobles and the rulers. He rebuked them for charging their brother's interest. They were breaking the Torah by doing this. We're not going to read all these, but you can look up uh, the law that they were breaking. Exodus chapter number 22, verses 12 to 27. Leviticus 25, 35 to 54. And then we read this morning Deuteronomy 23, 19 through 20. Those are all places where they were taking advantage of the law that they were breaking. He told them that, uh, that they had done what they could to buy back their brothers. They, they had done everything they could. They raised up all this money and they bought, they bought back their brothers from bondage. And now guess what? Now they're living in their own land, but they're living in bondage. They're living in bondage to the, these uh, nobles and the rulers. Notice that they had nothing to say. How many of you have ever done something that was kind of dumb and someone tells you, hey, what you've done is, that, that, was, that was kind of silly. And you have no response because you know exactly what you did was not the best thing to do. That's where we find the nobles. 
Nehemiah tells him, hey, guys, you broke the Torah. You've, you've brought your brothers that you bought out of slavery back into slavery. So uh, we must stop this. It's impossible to argue against the Word of God, isn't it? Uh, what the Word of God says, it's impossible to argue against because this is absolute truth. No matter what the world tries to tell us, the Bible is absolute truth. It is not relative truth, it's absolute. And so it's hard to argue against the Word of God. Once Nehemiah composed himself and went to the nobles, he used the law to get them to understand that what they were doing was wrong. He continues by telling them what they are doing isn't good. They should fear or reverence God enough to stop what they're doing. If they had any respect or reverence for God, they would stop doing what they were doing because they were taking advantage of the people of God. By doing what they were doing, they were inviting the reproach of their enemies. They, they, they were opening the door for the enemies to reproach them. Then we see that Nehemiah set the example. He, his servants and brethren were lending them money and corn and not charging interest. And now he was asking the nobles and the rulers to do the same thing. Nehemiah wasn't asking them to do anything that he wasn't already doing. Nehemiah, we'll see, Nehemiah was, was pretty well off in, in that standard. We'll see what he was feeding the people. He was feeding uh, close to 500 people a day. Every day for 12 years, close to 500 people a day. Nehemiah was well off, but he didn't allow, he didn't use that against people. No, he was letting them borrow the things they needed and not charge them interest. They only had to pay back what they borrowed. In verse number 11, he calls for them to return the interest they had charged on things that broke the covenant. One commentary said this, apart from the knowledge of Yahweh and apart from the covenant between him and Israel, there is no basis for the moral indignation Nehemiah had. There is no moral authority for the appeal and no moral direction for instruction. Apart from these things, Nehemiah didn't have a leg to stand on, but because of what God had told them to do, he had every right to be angry, he had every right to appeal to them to give it back, and he had every right to give them this direction that they needed. So why is all that important? Why does that matter at all? Because what they had done by breaking God's law is they had slowed down the rebuilding of the wall by doing so. Nehemiah had to stop all the work. Notice that he had to bring together a great council. That means he, he stopped the work and brought everyone together and was telling them all these things. One of the amazing things about Nehemiah is Nehemiah wasn't a preacher. Huh? Nehemiah was an evangelist. What was Nehemiah? Nehemiah was just an ordinary guy who wanted to see God's work continue. So what did Nehemiah do? Nehemiah led the charge to right the ship. He tells them, hey guys, what we've been doing, it's not right. We, we can look at the law, we can look at uh, the things in God's law, and we can see, hey, what we're doing is not right. We must get this right. In verse number 12, we see the response to Nehemiah. They agreed to give back everything that they had taken and required no more interest on what they were giving them. So Nehemiah, he, he didn't exactly believe them. So what did he do? He went and got a priest. He said, hey, we're gonna make, if we're going to make this covenant, we're going to do it right. And if we're going to make this promise... We're going to make it from the priest so that we are we are both bound to keeping this. Nehemiah went and got the priest so that they could take an oath that they would keep this promise. In verse number 13, we see the result of them not keeping their promise. Look at verse number 13. It says, And also I shook my lap and said, So God shake out every man from his house, from his labor, that performeth not this promise. Even thus he be shaken out of and emptied. And all the congregation said, Amen, and praised the Lord, and the people did according to the promise. So Nehemiah said, Hey, if we don't keep this promise, what's going to happen? You guys are gone. Your house is going to be shaken. You're going to be thrown out of your houses. You're going to be thrown out of this land. Uh, everything that you've labored for is worthless. You must keep this covenant. 
We have come too far to turn back now. We must go forward in rebuilding the wall. All the congregation, when they were told this, they said, Amen. What does Amen mean? It means that they agree. It means so be it. They are agreeing with what is said. And then what did they do? They praised the Lord. They praised the Lord not because they were losing money. No, they praised the Lord because they were keeping a covenant with the Lord. They praised the Lord because there was unity back among the brethren. They, they didn't have to worry anymore about selling their kids into slavery or, or getting rid of their houses or anything like that because this covenant that was made. Then the Bible says that they all kept their promise. They all kept, the, the, and the people did according to this promise. They didn't, none of them broke it. Then we see in verses 14 through 19, Nehemiah's godly example to them. <clears throat> During Nehemiah's first 12-year term, and then again during his second term in office, he never once used his privileges to build his own kingdom, but rather to help those in need. We think about the day that Nehemiah lived in, and that day most officials exercised authority in order to promote themselves. They wanted to be promoted, they wanted people to worship them, they wanted people to bow down, and they did everything they could to protect their personal interests. But Nehemiah was different. Nehemiah wasn't there to protect his interest. No, Nehemiah was there to give it away. Nehemiah could have used his expense account for personal expenses or for household expenses, but instead he used it to build the wall. He, he used it to build the things that he needed. He didn't tax the people in order to have something to eat. He paid for it out of his own pocket. Nehemiah was a great example to the people of how they should act as leaders. Dio Moody said this, A holy life will produce the deepest impression. Lighthouses blow no horns, they only shine. Think about a lighthouse. A lighthouse isn't there, it's not honking, it's not blowing fog horns or, or horns that people know, it's shining lights and guiding the direction. Uh, Nehemiah didn't have to get up there and blow a horn from on top of the wall. No, what did he do? He led by example. As believers, we should lead by example in our everyday life. We shouldn't take advantage of people. We shouldn't uh, talk bad about people. We should, we should keep our eyes on Jesus. That's exactly what Nehemiah did. Nehemiah could have, could have done anything he wanted. He was the, the ruler of the land. But what did he do? He took care of those that needed it. <clears throat> they paid their own bills. Nehemiah and all of his servants and all of, the, all of his house paid their own bills. They, they didn't get the people to pay their bills. And they were careful not to exploit the people in any way. Look at verse number 15. It says, But the former governors that had been before me were chargeable unto the people and had taken of them bread and wine beside forty shekels of silver. Yea, even their servants bear rule over the people. But so did not I, because of the fear of God. He said, you know what, the, the rulers before me, they took advantage of the people. They took bread from them, they took, uh, they took drink from them, they took 40 shekels in taxes from them. They did all these things, but look, I didn't do those things, not because I'm better than them, no, but because I fear the Lord. Why should we treat people right? Because we reverence the Lord enough. We are ambassadors. We are representatives of Jesus Christ. We are representatives of God. We should act like it. There's nothing more embarrassing than an ambassador of a country to go and to embarrass a whole country. Right? As believers, we should be great ambassadors. We should be great people of our Lord and Savior who we represent. So he was a great example to the people in his finances. He was a great example to the people in his working. Verse number 16 says, Yea, also I continued in the work of this wall, neither, brought, uh, neither bought me any land, and all my servants were gathered thither unto the work. Here we see that leaders must set the example. And that's what Nehemiah did. Nehemiah got up every day and went to work. Nehemiah got up every day, and he was right there next to people building the wall. 
He, he wasn't the supervisor. No, he was a boss that got in there and helped his people out. You've probably all heard the saying, but people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And so Nehemiah showed that he cared for the people by working alongside them. He was there with a hammer in hand ready to work every day. And we as Christians must be ready to work every day as well. So he's a great example to the people in finances. He's a great example in his people and his work ethic. And then he, he was a great example in taking care of people. Look at verse number 17. It says this, Moreover there were at my table an hundred and fifty of the Jews and rulers besides, beside those who, that came unto us from among the heathen that are about us. Now that which was prepared for me was daily was one ox and six choice sheep. Also fowls were prepared for me. And once in ten days store of all sorts of wine. Yet for all this required not I the bread of the governor because the bondage was heavy upon this people. We see that Nehemiah was regularly feeding 150 people, and that didn't count those that weren't of the brethren, right? Those who were uh, who were outside of the Jewish uh, community that came to help. The food mentioned in verse number 18 is estimated to be able to feed over 500 people every day. Think about that. We how how do you feed five people a day? Sometimes that's a lot of work, isn't it? Especially for five kids, and all they do is eat. Here we see Nehemiah was feeding 500 people every day. Why? Because he cared for them. Notice he says that he didn't take any bread from the king. This was all out of Nehemiah's pocket. Why didn't he take any money as the king? Why didn't he take any bread as the king? Because he saw the burden that the people were already under. He didn't want to add to the burden of the people. So we see that Nehemiah set the example in his finances. He set the example in his work ethic. He set the example by taking care of his people. But I think the most important thing and the most important thing that we can do is that everything we do pleases the Lord. Notice verse 19. He didn't pray that the people would talk about how great he was, but rather that God would bless him for blessing people. This is the fourth time that Nehemiah makes one of these many prayers. He says this in verse 19, Think upon me, my God, for good according to all that I have done for this people. All he asked, he didn't ask God to, to give him you know, more. He didn't ask God to give him you know, greater riches. He didn't ask God to give him greater houses or anything like that. What did he ask for? He asked that God would give him good. That's all he asked for. Good according to what I have done. Nehemiah, everything he did was in order to please God. As believers, everything we should do should be in order to please God. Conclusion this morning. Problems arise at every corner as Nehemiah is rebuilding the wall. But here is it's the brethren taking advantage of the brethren. I'll close with this psalm. And this psalm really... Uh, feeds into what's going on here. Psalm 133, I quote it often, but it's an important psalm. It says this, brethren, or it says, behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It is like the precious ointment upon the head that ran down upon the beard, even Aaron's beard, that went down to the skirt of his garments, as the dew of Hermon, and as the dew that descended upon the mountains of Zion, for there the Lord commanded the blessing for even life forevermore. We should dwell together in unity. When we are unified, God is magnified. And we should want to magnify the Lord. I think we can sum all this up into one statement. Let's strive to be a helper in the work and not a hinderer in the work. Let's pray. God, thank you this morning for your word. I thank you for Nehemiah. And God, we see uh, this book, the Bible. It shows the good, the bad, and the ugly. God, we see this morning there was some ugliness going on there in uh, Jerusalem as they're trying to rebuild the wall. And God, I'm thankful that you show us 
the leadership of Nehemiah as he writes the shoot. God, I pray that you help us to be helpers in the work and not hinderers. Bless our services to follow. Just your name, pray. Amen.